this morning to just set in your heart and affections again. Whether it's your first time um, today or you have been here for the past few days, I just want to encourage you to just give whatever that is on your heart towards the Lord in this place. Mm, we come as we are. This morning we come bare before you. You do not despise us, even in our weakness. Here we are, this is all I can give, this is all I can bring to you.
Let it know. 
It's all said when it's all done. I pray I loved you with my whole heart and made the most of every moment and every chance that you provide. Day.
the good fight throughout my days here in this pilgrim life cause it doesn't matter what man save me many of us to just renew our vows even in His presence. Vows that we have made when we were youths. Vows that we have made years ago that we have had difficulty walking in. Just feel the invitation of the Lord even now just to take a minute or two and say, Lord, I want to renew my vows of love, of abandonment. My vows to love you my vows to love the people around me because of the love that you have poured out into my heart. My vows of devotion. Lord, we're making plans. We have every intention in our heart, Lord, to stay committed to our vows until the end, to fight the good fight, to finish the race. Yeah, just begin to whisper and speak out your vows to the Lord right now. So you're making plans. I'm making plans now. I'm moving things around to make you first, Lord, in this heart of mine. I'm building fences. Precious, I'm breaking covenant with the words. Just want us to make it plans. I'm making plans now. I'm moving things around to make you first, Lord. In this heart of mine, I'm building fences. Uh, it's my privilege uh, to introduce uh, this morning's speaker, uh, James. Uh, he's a really good friend of mine. I got a privilege to uh, meet him in Penang. We were staffing together. And then the following year, in 2016, we started uh, a one-week internship uh, in Big Hop. And ever since then, they have been continuing to today. Uh, and uh, we just want to really honor the nation of Philippines and also just a messenger that is represented from Philippines to share the message to with us this morning. Yeah, so welcome, James. He's a pastor. He's also leading uh, Vic Hop. Uh, actually, today, you know, if you don't know, uh, they've been, they, they started the House of Prayer uh, uh, for many years, and, to, and, and now they are building uh, the House of Prayer on the church, right, on the 
third floor or second floor? On the third floor, they are building a house of prayer on top of the church uh, for their next season. So let's just honor him and then uh, as we stretch our hands to pray for him uh, together. Stretch our hands and then we honor and we pray with James. Father, we just thank you for James. Uh, we thank you for the messenger that you have raised up, a voice uh, from the nation of Philippines. God, we really just want to honor him. We want to honor uh, even just the country, the Philippines. God, we just thank you that you will uh, sharpen our hearts and convict us and, and ignite our hearts again, edify us through your word and through your servant. So God, we just pray, we commit ourselves to you and to your spirit. Uh, let us hear what the spirit has to say this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. All right, James. All right, good morning, everybody. And uh, I just want to say hi to all the Filipinos who are here. Can you raise your hands? You're here. Wow. These are the people who are running the race with us in the Philippines, and we just want to honor them. And of course, the Singaporeans, thank you for honoring us. I know, like, uh, our context that we are always serving you, right? But I was telling my wife this time, like, oh, the Singaporeans are serving the Filipinos. And with a Singa very good Singaporean hospitality, and I just want to honor that. Thank you, Jason, Burning Hearts team, and for all the Singaporeans that are here. Thank you so much for welcoming us and uh, for letting us speak to this region. So uh, I was asking, I was telling my wife last night, I told, I told her, like, how can I speak a sermon after Elijah Choi spoken? <laughs> I mean, if you, if you get that joke, right, it's like, how can I still speak a sermon tomorrow after Elijah, Elijah's preaching last night? So, um, you know, uh, where's Elijah? I mean, the 24 elders are upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, last conference, last 2019, right? Last 2019, uh, Elijah came here, and I also came here to be the speak, one of the speakers, and then we, they put us in one room. You know, the message of Elijah didn't impact me. You know what impacted me? His life. Because we were roommates. And then during our, our vacant time, I guess, I mean, I'm just sitting there looking at my phone or playing with my phone, and then Elijah was just walking around in the room, just speaking in tongues. And it's like very loud prayers like, and I was telling myself, what am I doing with my life? I'm, speak <laughs> I'm a speaker and I'm playing with my phone. And this guy is like walking around, like speaking in tongues, praying, interceding. Then every morning he wakes up like every 4 a.m. In, in our room and he, went, he goes out. Sometimes he wakes me up and said like, James, I'm going to go out. I'll go to the lobby and pray. But then I can still hear him praying from the lobby. So, uh... So uh, this guy is a crazy guy in a good way. I, he's the real deal. Yeah, I swear. So um, <laughs> his life, I mean, his life impact, it's not the message. It was his life, you know. And uh, Andrew told us yesterday that he was the tribute of burning hearts, right? And um, I think Jason wanted me to speak because he wanted me to be the tribute of the region. And, and truly, while everyone was speaking during this conference, I feel like I'm being slaughtered. <laughs> I mean, first because, I mean, my third language is English. Like, oh, I cannot really speak good English on the butt. And also the speakers are very anointed, you know. But uh, I believe the Lord has given us different anointing and giftings. And sometimes it's not the words that comes from our mouth, but it's the life that we are living. And I... When Andrew Tom was speaking yesterday, it's like everything that he's saying is, is my sermon. <laughs> it's like I feel like I'm being, I was being slaughtered. It's like, so next time you put me first before that. <laughs> <it's> like, <laughs> yeah, that's really what I felt yesterday. It's like, oh my God, I need to change my sermon. <laughs> so I told my wife, this is, this is really true. I told my wife, you can ask my wife. I need to stay in the prayer room, in the worship encounter. I just need to really listen to God. Maybe I, 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 I listened wrong from God when I was making this sermon. You know, but when I was doing things, then someone interrupted me. It's like, oh, I'm doing, I mean, I'm rushing. And then someone interrupted me. But then someone came to me. I mean, I, I knew her before. But then she just came talking to me like that. 
I mean, you had a good conversation about what she's doing and all. Like, I won't mention her name. But then she said, can I pray for you? So she started praying for me. And then she started praying my sermon that I prepared. The, the sermon that I prepared before, she started praying for me. And then I said, Lord, is this you? Is this a coincidence? Or is this really you telling me not to change my message? But then after the service last night, someone again prayed for me. And he prayed again my sermon. So I said, Lord, I'll speak whatever you want me to speak. I'll not change my topic, my sermon today. So this will be what I'll be speaking this morning. And... um. Sometimes as messenger, all we need to do is to obey what God wants us to speak. I believe it's not the eloquence, but it's the message of God that God wants us to speak to the people. And I believe the Lord has a message for us in this region. And as people of God, I believe we should ask, what's our finish line? Do you know what's your finish line? I, I know Joshua is always saying, the finish line is the return of Christ. That's true. But I believe there's a deeper aspect to that. And that's what I've been internalizing for the past 10 years of Vegan House of Prayer. We've been doing, I've been doing House of Prayer for the past 10 years. And I've been asking, Lord, I don't want to do a lot of things. I've been doing this for 10 years. I want to align myself to what you really desire. To what you really want. I want to simplify my life. I want to cut off all the options so that I could do whatever you want me to do. And sometimes doing that will cost you a lot of things, even the people that surround you, the choices that you make, the things that you do. And, and as people of God, we should ask, what's our finish line? Is it revival? Is it Great church attendance in our churches because I'm working in a local church, right? Is it success or having all these things, nice house, nice car, nice material things? Or is it Christ's return? But I believe there's a deeper aspect into that. And what I've learned when I read the whole Bible, I mean, I'm not a theologian. I've never been to a Bible school. As I've said before, my teacher is the Holy Spirit. My Bible school is the prayer room. And what I've learned is that the Lord wants communion with us. Even from the beginning in the garden, he wanted communion. He created all of this. He created the Garden of Eden so that he could commune with us fully. And even unto the end, that's, her, that's his desire to fully commune with us. It started in the garden in full communion with him and it will end in the city in full communion with him. That's how I made it very simple. Like, so Lord, if this is what you want, communion, I'll commune with you. Because I just want to simplify things in my life. And in John 17, verse 20 to 24, I just want to read it to you. I don't have any PowerPoint. I'm not a Singaporean. <laughs> I, they said it's a Singaporean thing, right? But in jo John chapter 17, verse 20 to 24, and Jesus said, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you love me even before the creation of the world. I believe this is what God desires even from the beginning. The Bible always says, there's a lot of verses that, I will dwell with them, and they will dwell with me. But I don't think that the Lord just wants to dwell with us. He wants to be one with us. And this is what the verses are saying. It is what he wanted in the Garden of Eden. 
This is what he wanted when he asked Moses to build the tabernacle so that he could dwell with his people. This is what he wanted. Or it is the reason why David built the tabernacle of David. And it's the reason why David had an idea to build him a temple in Mount Zion. And I believe communion is why Jesus came the first time. To restore the communion with God, between God and man that was lost in the garden. And I believe communion is the reason why missions exist. We just don't want them to be saved. We want these tribes and tongues, languages, to commune with God. It's not just about saving them, but for them to know God on this side of eternity, to experience Him deeply. And I believe, as a pastor, as someone who's working in the local church, I believe it's why the church exists, to commune with Jesus. And lastly, I believe it's why He will come again. It's all because of communion, to dwell with us, to commune with us, and to be one. I believe this is the eternal desire of God, a burning full communion with men. And God did not change that plan. This is not a new thing. God did not change His plan from the garden. When Adam and Eve fall into sin, He did not change His plan. It was still His plan until today. That's why we are here. You are not just here to consume something from God. You are here to commune with God. And when believers gathered, it's not about receiving something from God. It's all about ministering at the feet of Jesus, communing with Him, loving Him, conversing with Him. That's the purpose of the church. That's the purpose of this gathering. And as people of God and as Gentiles, we are grafted into His story. And I said, now that I know the bigger picture that God wants to commune with me, I need to align myself to what Jesus desire. I just don't want the story. I just don't want to know the story. I want to be part of this story. I want to be part of his story. And I was telling to God, Lord, I want to be part of your story, of what you're doing on the nations of the earth, especially in the Philippines. I mean, they always say like, uh, I'm a voice in the region, but me, myself, like, Lord, give me Philippines. Give me Philippines. Oh, even if it's just Philippines. Jason got Singapore. Joshua got Malaysia. Just give me, or give me vegan city. That's enough for me. For me, that's one of my goals. Give me my city. And when we talk about alignment with God, I believe King David was one of the best examples of whose heart was aligned with God because the Bible said, he was a man after God's own heart. Why did God call him a man after God's own heart? Not because he was a good boy or a proper man or something like that, but because of his communion with God. And because of that communion, it, it aligned him to the heart of God. How many of us, we are doing a lot of things, but still misses what's the desire of God? Because it's possible. We can do a lot of things in our ministries, in our church, in our lives, but we never ask, Lord, is this what you desire? Is this part of your story? Or I'm just doing things, or I'm just creating my own story. We are misaligned, is that term? Misaligned or disaligned? Right? So, we can do a lot of things for God and still miss what He really desire. And I can say that coming from a church leader's perspective, one who's laboring in the church. As you know, in the church, there's a lot of things that's going on. Sometimes I, I, I pity our staff because most of the staff sign up to be full-time when they came from burn internship in Malaysia. And after that, they said, I want to be full-time. I want to minister before the Lord for many hours. So they sign up to be full-time, but when they arrive in church, that's not the thing that they're only doing. They're doing a lot of stuff, and that's part of it. I mean, I'm not criticizing the church. I love the church. Right? But that's part of laboring in the church. So, and sometimes we think that to please God, we need to do this or to be like this. 
but it's the simplicity of our communion with God and devotion to Him that pleases Him. And sometimes we forget that. Uh, with this sharing, there will be times I will share to you my personal journey and probably Vigap's journey because this is the things that God is doing in our lives. There was a time in my life wherein I felt so dry. I mean, I think it's this early this year. I go in the prayer room, I preach, I pray, I just do the ministry stuff, but I felt dry. I felt like I do not love God. I don't know if you've experienced this in your life, but early this year I felt that. I was not asking the Lord, why is this happening to me? But suddenly, I saw my very old guitar in the church, my very old red guitar. And then, I just started getting that guitar and just singing before the Lord. And then suddenly, there's a flashback. The Lord showed me last 2013 what I've been doing in that room. And I've been singing, worshiping Him alone in that room. And then the Lord told me, James, you are not my preacher. I don't know if that's a rebuke, but he said it with love. James, you are not my preacher. You are my beloved. I choose you not because you're good in speaking. I choose you because of this. And I called you for me. You are my beloved. I believe there's something with singing before the Lord, with our simplicity of our devotion that aligns us to what God really desires, that aligns us to what God desires and not what we desire. So, I believe when God called King David to be a king, the last time I spoke, I've spoken about King David again, right? When he was a young boy. But now after three years, he was now a king, right? <laughs> when, God, when God called King David to be a king, he knew, David knew that God's desire was beyond him as individual. David's calling was for God and for a people. And I read to you in Acts 13, 22. It says there, When he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, or of whom he testified and said, I have found in David the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. First, David was called to be for God, to minister to God. And then second, he will do all the will of God. David was called for God and to call for a people. He is for God first and then to call a people. And what's David's first command as a king? His first command as a king is not just to bring the Ark of the Covenant, but to call the nation of Israel and to call the Levites and the priesthood. And when I read that verse, I think that was significant. He didn't just want the Ark of the Covenant. He wanted to call the Levites and the priesthood. Why? I asked, why? Because the priesthood and the Levites during that time, they were sent out by King Saul. During King Saul's time, they were sent out by King Saul to the field to make a living. The Levites and the priesthood are no use for King Saul during his reign. But with David, he called them back unto Jerusalem. And I think that was significant because he could have said, I'm a man after God's own heart. I can do this alone. I can minister to God alone. But no, he did not do that. He called the Levites and the priesthood. I don't know if it's for you that significant, but for me, that is very significant. And sometimes we also emphasize on individuals like King David, like these people on the Bible, right? But we forgot these Levites, this priesthood who are ministering before the presence of the Lord in the tabernacle of David. But God is not looking for individuals. God is not looking for individuals. He desires a people. And David knew that. David knew that God desires a people. Especially in this context, he used David to call for a people. When God called us, he just didn't call us to prosper us or to increase us. Every time or most of the time, he called us 
to call for a people. Because God is not looking for individuals. He used David to call for a people to host the presence of God on earth. And that people was the nation of Israel to minister before the Lord. Because God desires a people. I think just to be a Singaporean a little bit, that's my point number one. God desires a people. God desires a people. In Revelation chapter 8, John, John the Beloved, saw a people. And in this context, he's not talking about the political nations, but people from every tribe and tongue who pledge their allegiance to Jesus. And can I just read it to you? In Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 to 15, John did not sow individuals. He saw multitudes. Can you say multitudes? Pastor, right? Multitudes. He saw multitudes in white robes, nameless and faceless. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 to 15, it says there, I just love reading verses. After this, I look and behold a great multitude that no one could number. From every nation, from all tribes. Oh, I'm seeing Philippines there. From all tribes and peoples and languages is standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes? And from where they have, have they come? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. And while reading this, there was a question last night or yesterday. Does it really work? I think that's the theme of this. That's the theme of, and I've been asking myself, because I've been doing this for 10 years, and it's all going to be a waste if it doesn't work. Right? It's good to ask. I mean, does it really work? Does this house of prayer really works? But when I read those verses, every tribe, every tongue, I was telling myself, I can see Philippines there. I can see Singaporeans there on the multitudes. I can see Koreans there, the tribes and tongues. I can see every nation on that multitudes. And I was trying to remember the internal imagination of Elijah Choi on that stadium with Jason Chua. And about Satan telling Jason in the empty stadium, empty stadium, right? Did I hear it right? Asking, does it really work? But I was telling myself last night, the measure of our success with our ministry before the Lord is not the stadium. So Satan, you asked in the wrong court. You asked in the wrong place. Why did you ask in this stadium? Because that's not how we measure our success in the ministry, not in the stadium. The stadium represents the worldly success. And I said, if Satan will ask me that kind of question in the Philippines, James, will it really work? Does it really work? I will tell him in the face. I will tell him, in the perception of this world, it will not work. But go and look in that small prayer room But go and look in that small prayer room in Vegan, and you will see it really works. There are three people ministering before the Lord. Who gave their lives wholeheartedly before Him because He is worthy. 
Go and look on the churches in the rice paddies in the Philippines, in Vietnam. Go into the underground churches. And I will tell you, it really works. Not on the stadium. Sorry, I'm crying. You know, in a world we're in, people applaud you when you are in a conference like this. I mean, in the Philippines, this is a big deal. Me speaking here in front, like in an international, like, wow, James, like that. They, up, they will applaud just like, wow, you're big time or whatever, like in the Philippines, in, in, in my place, like that. But on the contrary, they call you crazy for wasting your time in the prayer room for eight hours a day. That's the world that we are living in. But to sit before the Lord and minister to Him is the highest call that, no, that one could ever be. Sometimes you have this wrong notion of revival. And I just, I just made this, you know. False revival is when everything is increasing in a church, but the revelation of the beauty of Jesus and longing for His return is not. That's false revelation. Everything is increasing, everything is growing, but the revelation about who Jesus is, how beautiful He is, and the longing for His return is not increasing with His people. And our primary assignment as His people is to minister to Him continually. Don't you know that every time the kings of Israel tried to tried to reorder or to bring back the ministering in the temple, there was revival that happened in, in the Old Testament in, in Israel. Because this Israel is a priestly nation, and this is the thing that they should be doing. So let's go back to David. David brought the Ark of the Covenant into the tabernacle that he built in the capital of Israel. And he organized the Levites, priesthood, gatekeepers, and a lot of people. And he paid for all of it. It was costly. It was expensive. No? And day and night, there was a continuous ministering before the Lord in the middle of Jerusalem. The glory of God was fully manifesting in their midst and in the whole nation. It was a glimpse of a Garden of Eden. This is what God wants. A glimpse of Garden of Eden because there was full communion. There's a communion with God as a nation. It was a literal heaven on earth, a convergence of heaven and earth. And David caught what was happening in Revelation chapter 4 in eternity because of his alignment to God. See, we can do a lot of things, but if, we, if our heart's not aligned to God's heart, everything is meaningless. Maybe we're doing the secondary things, but not the main thing that God wants us to do. And David ushered Israel. He called Israel as God's people into continuous ministering before the Lord. Because in Exodus chapter 19, verse 5, it says there, God said to them, to the nation of Israel, Now if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples on earth. For all the earth belongs to me, and you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. And this is the message you must give to the people of Israel. Israel was called to be a priestly nation. They are not like every other nation. That's why God was quite angry when the people wanted king. But then God said, am I not your king? Why are you looking for king just like the other nation? It shouldn't work that way. I am your divine king. I will protect you. I will provide for you. Right? Because Israel was called to be a priestly nation. And this is what made Israel different from other nations. Because God was in their midst. David was a king, but he led the people to worship and to minister to the king of kings. But I just want to add this. Before David had brought the Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem... There was this man called Obed-Edom. I know Jason told this 
told this uh, yesterday. Right? Or the ark stayed in two houses, not just Obed-Edom. It stayed in Abinadab's house and stayed in Obed-Edom's house. The ark stayed for 20 years in Abinadab's house, but it was not working. There was no manifestation of the presence of God. I believe they grew familiar of the presence of God. They were not in awe of the presence of God. That's why when the cart stumbled, Uzzah, the son of Abinadab, tried to touch the, 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 the Ark of the Covenant, and he died. There was no awe. There was no fear. He grew familiar. There was no ministering in the presence of God in that house. That's why there was no manifestation of God. But in the house of Obed-Edom, for three months, the Bible said that because of the presence of God in that house, Obed-Edom was blessed and all of his household. I believe in that house, there was a continuous ministering before the Lord. They redesigned their house, probably they redesigned their house, their lifestyle. They put the ark on the center just to minister before the Lord. And when David heard that God's presence was so full in the house of Obed-Edom, it provoked him into a holy jealousy. So what did he do? He brought back the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem because before he doesn't want to bring back already because someone died, right? But because of what he, what he heard about Obed-Edom, he brought back the Ark of the Covenant into Israel. This is significant church or people. <laughs> I feel like I'm sure. Significant because Obed-Edom was a Gentile. I mean, it's debatable. Some people said he's not a Gentile. But I believe he's a Gentile. And when David pitched his tabernacle of David in the middle of Jerusalem, Obed-Edom, I believe, became a part of the service in the tabernacle of David. And it was a foreshadow of what will happen at the end of the age. When the new man the fullness of the Gentiles and the Jews come together and will minister before the Lord. And now I'll go to my second point about David's alignment to the heart of God. After that, David had an ambition. David had a dream. David had an idea, a dream of his heart. The, I, I believe the idea doesn't just came from him. I believe that through his communion, it aligned him to the heart of God. And he said, while he was on his mansion, on his palace, said, this is not right. I'm living on a cedar house, but my God is dwelling on a tent. And Nathan said, the prophet, Nathan, go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. It's as if Nathan was telling, David, no need for confirmation. This is what on God's heart. Do whatever God wants you to do. Nathan said, this is a God thing. This is what he desires, David, a permanent dwelling place. And you know what's God's word for me? Why I said yes to Jason. Earlier I was just joking, right? But this time, you know what's God's word for me? Why I said yes again to Jason. Not to be a tribute, but to be a Nathan to Jason. I messaged him. I don't know if he received my message, my reply during time. I told Jason, Jason, do whatever God wants you to do regarding the 24-7. Because that was, that's what God is putting in my heart. And I believe it's not coincidence that your son is Nathan. And the last time, there's a Nathan who came. Go and do whatever God wants you to do. And I just want to read this whole verse in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1 to 17. And I believe you love reading God's word, right? Yes, I love reading God's word. I just felt the emotions of God here. That's why I want to read this. When the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan, the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? 
I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. As if the Lord was telling David, really, David, you will build me a house. I just felt the emotions and joy of God when David said, I want to build God a dwelling place. Will you build me a house to dwell in? Since I have, I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. I'm just living, I was just living a tent, in a tent. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? I was not asking for it. I did not ask for it, but I believe it was on God's heart. And now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and I will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all of your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the son of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever in according with all these words, in accordance with all this vision Nathan spoke to David. One thing that I've learned on this very long verses that I've read is that God, this, the next second point, next G. Number two, God desires a permanent dwelling place on earth. God desires a permanent dwelling place here on earth. With this one dream, one idea of David's heart, God's heart was very moved. He was saying, really, David, you will build me a house and because of that idea of David, God said, I will make a covenant with you. When David built a tabernacle, God did not make a covenant with David. But when David said, I will build a permanent dwelling place of God here on earth, and God said, I will make my covenant with you. And I just wrote here that the things are the things that we are doing in our lives, in our ministries, is it connected to the story or the bigger story that God desires? Or we just do whatever we want to do with our lives, our own church families. But when we give our life to God, when we gave our life to God, it's not our story anymore. It is His story. The reason why we go to church every Sunday, the reason why we try to discipline ourselves, the reason why we're throwing, throwing ourselves into this prayer movement, the reason why, why we pray 24-7, the reason why we just, we just serve the Lord, go to missions, is because He is coming back again for full communion on Jerusalem, on Mount Zion. But David was not a perfect person. God used him, but there, he has a fair share of misalignment. You know when David put a census, he said like, oh, can we make a census to all the people here in Israel? And the Bible said it was Satan's idea, right? Probably it rooted from a place of pride and self-reliance. And Israel doesn't work that way. And sometimes we think like that. We work like that. Oh, can we count them? Can we count this? I mean, it's not bad, right? But with the case of David, God was not pleased. And it killed God, I mean, allowed or killed 70,000 people because of that. 
It was David's fault, but many people died. But I think here's the highlight of David's career as a king. It's not the tabernacle of David, but this one idea. For me, this is what I believe. That made God, yes, David, you're the man after my own heart. When David said, I will build you a permanent place on a place that you really love. On Jerusalem, on Mount Zion. I believe that made God go crazy. It's like, yes. You know what's on my heart. You got it. You're the only one who got this. I've been looking from all the judges. I've been waiting. But you're, only, you're the only one who got this, David. Because that address is very special to him and his people who are there. And God said, these are my people and I want to dwell with them. I just want to set an example, right? If I will say to Jason, Jason, because I'm a good friend, instead of living on an, what do you call that? HDB, HDB? You're living in HDB, right? Or a mansion? No. <laughs> I want to build you a house. Jason, I want to build you a house because I love you as a friend. I want to build you a house. But here's the catch. I will build you a house in vegan. And I know what Jason will say. I don't want to go to vegan. 100%. If I will say to Jason, I will build you a house in vegan, and Jason will say, this guy doesn't get my heart. Because I remember whenever Joshua tried to convince Jason to go somewhere else, Jason said, I just want to stay here in Singapore. Because that's his heart. That's his heart. I don't know if that's a good example, all right? But, but Jason will be thankful that I will build him a house in vegan, but he will not be happy. He will not be rejoicing. Why? Because he does not have any history with the people there. They are not his people. And I believe God has had a full history in Mount Zion. This place is very close to his heart and the people who are there. And when David built the tabernacle of God, yes, David, yes, God was pleased with what he'd done, but when David said, I will build you a permanent dwelling place on Mount Zion, this had made God seal the deal with David. And I just want to read to you in Psalm 132, verse 13 to 4. It says there, For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever and here I will dwell, for I have, I have desired it. Before, it doesn't make sense for me. Why do I need to love Israel and to pray for Israel? I just don't get it, you know. But because this man that we love, the son of man that we love, he's a Jewish man. And these are his people. And we as Gentiles, we are grafted into this family. And we need to love our brothers, not because they are lovable, because they are not. I remember when I went to Israel. Is there any, are there any Jews here? <laughs> Is that okay? When I went to Israel with some of our friends, yes, we, I mean, during the One King, if you want to go to One King, Samuel Whitefield, $2,000. You know. um, we stayed, after that, we stayed with our friend, and then we went to a bus. And then I sat down with a Jew on a bus. And then what did he do? He, 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 he stood and then he, he went away from me. This guy is something. So prideful. But does he think of me? I'm impure or something? Like that. <laughs> so in short, they are not really, I mean, there are some, but like, they are, yes, not lovable. I don't know how to rephrase it, right? <laughs> but because Jesus loves them and he's a Jewish man, we will love them. We love what he loves. And we are aligning ourselves to the desire of God, and God desires them. That's it. God desires them. That's why we are praying for them. Actually, that's why we are building our house of prayer, because we love them. And I just want to affirm all those people who are building God a resting place, or who are helping, or who want, or are helping to build God a resting place in your city, in your nation, that what we are doing is not a man's idea. 
and to know that reality that this is not man's idea that will make me go all the way until the end. Nathan said, do whatever that is in your heart. It's not just your idea, Jason. It's not just your idea, Josh, what we are doing. I mean, you're the one who mentored me, right? But I'm telling you, it's not our idea. <laughs> what we are doing in the internship, though they say we're crazy, 12-hour burn, 42 days fasting, 21 days fasting, it's not man's idea. It's God's idea. We are what Isaiah 62 is talking about. And it says there, I have posted watchmen on your walls, Jerusalem. We are the watchmen. We are walking into that reality. They will never be silent day and night. You call on the Lord, give yourselves no rest, and give him no rest till he establishes Jerusalem and makes her praise of the earth. What we are doing in our small prayer room is towards this to be watchmen on the walls of Jerusalem until he establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. This is what God desires. In our prayer rooms, it's not to make us a name or to make us an influencer, but it is to give Jesus no rest until he makes Jerusalem a praise so that Jesus Christ will come back again. It is a place of longing and yearning for Jesus. I'm almost done. And uh, I remember when I was last year, when we were, in, I, we were in the prayer room, it was a Thursday set, and I was just, I was just there, silent. I mean, usually I was just there being silent and all like that. You know, when you're 10 years in the prayer room, sometimes you're just tired moving and all, so you're just. But then the Lord reminded me, James, do you remember your vows last 2014 on that internship? Yes, I remember. And I was just, when God told me that, I was crying. Why? Because when I was sitting, my wife knows this, when I was sitting there, I was planning something. Because we have a daughter now, it's like we need to plan for her future. We need to invest, make a, do a business or something. I mean, it's not bad to add some things, do house prayer and do a business or something like that. right? But the Lord reminded me, do you remember your vow? I will not enter my house or put my eyes unto sleep until I find a dwelling place for the Lord. And said, I remember, Lord, but it hit me. Then he said, why are you planning to do these things? Where is my house? Where is the house that you will build for me? And I told that to my wife. And then during that time, our church are planning to build, to build a to have a building, new building. And then I was telling my wife, yes, we can build a prayer room on this, but we don't have money. I'm not telling this to fundraise, okay? I'm just really sharing this is serious. I know sometimes I'm funny, right? But this is serious. But we don't have resources. We have a baby. But me and my wife decided to give whatever we can give, not as a sacrifice, but as a love offering. And we were just crying at that moment. And here in Singapore, you have everything. In vegan, our people are ready to do a 24-7. But there's no space. I was telling Wilbert, our driver friend, right? Here in Singapore, you have everything. In the Philippines, we're looking for a prayer room we don't have for 10 years. But here, like, you have big churches, big spaces, and all of that. And here, you have so many resources. But the Lord is asking, where are my people? Of course, burning hearts. Of course, the pastors. But where are the other people 
who will build God a resting place here in this nation. I just want to read Psalm 132. I will not enter my house or get into my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. And in Malachi 1.11, favorite verse of Jason, from the rising of the sun until its setting, his name will be great among the nations and incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering for my name will be great among the nations. I believe that this is the reality that we are in today. That from the islands, the coastlands, from the Gentiles, incense will arise. And I'm glad that I'm part of this. I gl I'm glad that I've thrown myself into this, even though at the beginning I don't know what I'm doing. I just have a simple theology about the house of prayer or what's the end and the start. That's it. Just so I've shared to you, it's all about communion. That's it. I just want to throw myself into this. I just want to align myself. I don't know the details and all. But this is the reality that we are in. We are in Malachi 1.11, that the islands are singing, giving incense, love offering before the Lord. That on the islands of Singapore, incense will be offered to his name. On the rice paddies of the Philippines, incense will be offered to his name. In the beaches of Malaysia, in the kimchi of Korea, <laughs> incense, kimchi, <laughs> incense will arise. That there will be my people in every nation, in every tongue, tribe, and languages. There will be my people. And I will be with them. I will commune with them. And from the place of communion, the Lord will show us the harvest. We will not do the harvest. It's God who will do the harvest. But where's the asking? Where's the persistent asking? I remember, you know, the salvation of the Gentiles? It was not Peter or Cornelius who initiated that. It was God. God gave them a vision. And because Cornelius was a prayerful man, it's in the place of continuous ministering before the Lord. I'm not saying that this is it, but mean how I understand the Bible, I'm just throwing myself to that. That this house of prayer is a place of communion. Though in our context right now, it's a corporate communion with God. And I cannot do what I'm doing without the multitudes, without the nameless, faceless people who are behind my back in the Philippines. And I just want to honor them. There's no Mike Bika. <laughs> There's no Mike Bickle in my team who could encourage me. Or Joshua. There's no Joshua in VGAP. He just comes once in a while. There's no Jason. He doesn't want to go back. <laughs> yeah. He said, eight hours of bus. I'm done. I don't want to go. James, I think it's your time to preach. <laughs> Yes, I mean, there's, I mean, there's no Mike Bickle in our prayer room whom we can, like, look up to. But there are these heroes. My wife. And the nameless people who are ministering before the Lord in the prayer room. And I believe even here in Singapore and in your own prayer rooms. There are these people, they don't know how to inter do an intercession set or worship with the word, but they are just there. And for me, just seeing them ministering for the Lord in their seat, that's a big encouragement for me. That this really works. What we're doing really works. And most of them don't have the prayer language. Sometimes they're like, Lord, can you give me a prayer language like Elijah Choi, like the... The, you will be my God, you will be my people. I love that. Like the <laughs> Joshua, like split the sky and all. You know? 
Yeah. And Jason, what's, what's Jason's famous word? Like, they have this prayer languages, but like, in our house, we don't have that. <laughs> to be honest, I'm not trying to put down, but like, it's just the simplicity of ministering before the Lord. And some of them, they've given up their profession just to minister before the Lord. And they're receiving min minimum, <laughs> minimum salary. They said, it's okay, we will leave our profession. We just want to gaze upon Jesus. Just want to gaze upon Jesus with no other option. We will not do business. We will not do sideline. We will just gaze upon Jesus. We cut off everything because he is, he is our reward. We don't need money. And in this world, that's not success. And even in your context here. But for them, this is their love offering to Jesus. It's not a sacrifice. It's our joy. God is our joy and delight. And can we just all stand up? And this morning, I believe I have the grace to call for Psalm 132. To call those people who will say, I will not enter my house or get into my bed or give sleep to my eyes until I find a place, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. I'm not just talking about the singers and musicians, but the people the multitudes, I don't know, how can you give your love offering to the Lord? Maybe in supporting what God is doing here in Singapore or in your nation. Right? But those people who are saying, Lord, I will build you a resting place. Maybe some of you, just like what the MC had spoken this morning, you had a vow. That's why I was just, I was just uh, nodding my head because I had a vow. Maybe some of you had a vow before to build God a resting place. I don't know what that vow is. But the Lord wants to remind you this morning about this vow. It says there in what we read that from every time, tongues and language, these are the multitudes. And I believe we are that multitudes from different tribes and languages. And this morning, what I want us to do is, can we just minister before the Lord in our own language? I believe the Lord wants our language. Cry out to the Lord with your own language. Minister to Him with your own language. And if God is calling you to build Him a resting place, speak to Him in your own language. Lord, I want to build you your resting place in my city, in my church. It is not okay that you are just being ministered two hours a week while well, we're doing some other things. And if God is calling you to build him a resting place in your home, as a family, just like Cornelius and all his household, they prayed regularly to God. You can go to your wife, to your husband, and say, let's build God a resting place in our home. Let's just uh, be minister to us. Come on in your own language, just minister to him. 
start ministering before Him in your own language. If you're Chinese, if you're Malay, if you're Filipino, Korean, Lord, I want to build you a resting place. In my city, God, give it. We are your people. From every tribe, every tongue, every language, we are your people. Gathered in this place, committing ourselves, Lord, to build you a resting place. Will you be the build a resting place, God? Raise up a people, Lord, who will say, I will not rest. I will not enter into my house until I build God a resting place here in Singapore. Until I build God a resting place in Malaysia. Until I build God a resting place in the Philippines, in Cebu, in Thailand. I will not rest, God. We will count the cost, Lord. We will give everything to you, Lord, as a love offering because you are worthy, God. Our dreams, ambitions, the future of our children, Lord. Our life and incense before you, God. May this be an offering, Lord. This this is small prayer rooms that we are trying to build for you to dwell, Lord. This is not for us, Lord. This is for you, our offering for you, God, until you establish Jerusalem a praise to get what you desire, God. to your heart Jason, if you will allow me. If may I ask if you can go to someone that is not from your own nation? And can you just pray for one another? That God will raise you up to build him a resting place 
in your place, in your city, in your nation. If you can just do that, is that okay? If you have some, let's just find a partner from other nation if that's possible, from other language, other tribe, other people. So just move around, look for someone that you know is not from your nation. Just begin to just pull them along and just let's pray for one another and respond to the Lord accordingly. Just begin to pray for one another and just begin to contend for God's resting place for each other's nation. That God may have His rest in the nations. Just begin to contend for one another. Oh 